George, thanks for having a chat. Thanks for having me, Dan. So I wanted to speak to you for a while because I think, well, I would have spoken to you about your process to do with the cafe and now, now the restaurant. And it's been a long time coming and I've been saving up all my questions. So uh, hit me. Well, I'd like to start by saying, hey, when someone says, what do you do? What do you tell them? Um, yeah, it's, I tell them that I own uh, a cafe now. I used to have two, but recently sold one. So I say I'm a cafe and a small bar owner. And when, uh, how would you describe the cafe and the bar? Um, the cafe that I currently own is my second business that I've ever opened. It's uh, Morris, it's in Paddington, uh, just down the road from where we are now. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's a really different business to my first cafe. It's a really beautiful, under big trees, very like laid back, a much more like chilled out vibe. We're tucked behind the College of Fine Arts, we have a lot of art students, a real mishmash of kind of people there, really mixed demographic. You got a lot of like the Paddington locals and then the, the kind of more, I guess, uh, inner westy kind of art students. So we actually get a lot of crossover in, that, in our cafe at Morris from our, our previous cafe, Scouts on our, in Redfern. We have, because I think a lot of art students live in Redfern, so we had a lot of people, we were kind of surprised, but yeah, they, we used to see a lot of our regulars from Scouts in at Morris, which, which was really nice. But um, Morris was, um, was a was a project I guess that we kind of like did on on a whim. Um, definitely, my first cafe Scouts was my baby. It was my first ever business that I opened, and kind of came about by accident. But then it took me two years to get it under control because it was. I mean, you don't want to complain about success, but it was so successful that it kind of almost killed me. So it uh, it was actually the best learning experience for my hospitality um, inauguration because it was really tough. It was a really tough business. Very rewarding, but very tough. So you were saying it was your baby. Mm. When you, uh, what, what was your background like before opening Scouts? Have you, have you had any hospitality world training? Yeah, limited. Um, I'd worked a few like, hospitality jobs. Um, I, studied, um, I studied law. Um, before that, I actually studied a year of physio, trying to work out what I wanted to do as a grown up. And, um, but I studied law and I would I worked a few hospitality jobs while I was studying. I also did you practice law. I did. I practiced. I studied. So the study was for almost five years, and then I practiced for almost five years. Um, so long enough to well and truly work out that it was not for you by the time you moved on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the study of law itself, like the actual, like I went to UTS just down the road, and I loved it. Like the study of law is so fascinating. Um, you go to the courts, you meet all the high court judges, you know, you, you have access to some really amazing people and the lectures are incredible and, you know, you're learning about um, some of the most, like, amazing case law and, and you kind of have this, like, excitement in you that you think that when you leave law school that you're going to be, like, that that's, this is, this is how it's going to be all the time. And in reality, the practice of law, and I think you can probably ask 90% of people who practice law is not so glamorous. It's, it's, it's very much like a glorified administrative job. In a way, you kind of get very niche, you put into a very niche area and focus, the whole idea is to like really become an expert in a certain very specific field. And so you end up doing the same kind of thing over and over and over again, you get really good at it, but I don't know, I guess, what really struck me was that I'm a very mentor-driven person. Throughout my whole life, I've always had people that I admire and I look up to, and I've needed that in whether I was playing basketball and sport in my early days or um, studying or whatever I was doing, I always had, when, sometimes they came in the form of friends or a coach or even a partner. I've had that I've just meant, has mentored me in a way, but I, I kind of got to these, these law jobs and I was looking for that mentor and looking for that person just to inspire me to do great things and I just all the senior partners in my firms and I, I did have a few different law jobs they all just hated their job like they were like you know maybe eight nine years older than me sick very successful making you know making bank and doing really well and financially I guess but they just weren't happy and I was just like is this 
I was 20, you know, 25 at the time where I was like, God, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to be 35, invest another 10 years into this career and then work out that I'm miserable and also that I have a mortgage that I need to maintain and I can only maintain it. Like it's, it's the leaving that job was too high risk. And that's what they used to all say to me, the senior partners, the junior partners and that they'd be like, yeah, well, like we're not happy, but it's too late for us now. We're invested. I've invested 10 years into this career. I'm not going to start again. And they were just too far gone to in their heads to realize that even now I'm like, I'm almost 35. I feel like knowing how quickly you can change your career path, knowing how quickly you can turn your life around, I think I would like to say to them, like, no, like, you've got another, you know, 30 years of workforce. It's, do not sit in this job. At least, you know, I mean, I, I, the current generation is working till their mid-60s. By the time we're in our mid-60s, the average retirement age will probably be 80. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know what? I don't, like, I don't think people want to even retire. If you enjoy your job, I think people who don't, who are like don't love their work totally are looking at that 65 year mark and going oh, I can't wait to retire but um, if you love your job I don't see why you would want to stop working till you can't physically like I would I would be so bored to do nothing and isn't that the ultimate aim to find something that is so aligned with who you are and what you care about that the idea of not doing it doesn't really compute <laughs> yeah like even, you know, during my scouts days when I first opened the cafe, the cafe and I was working, you know, seven days a week, the most ridiculous hours, it was funny because I got, whenever I did get a little bit of time off, I just didn't even, I didn't, get, I didn't even know what to do with myself. Like, I was like, I have this day off and I don't know how not to work. But that's not a good thing either. <laughs> but, and I definitely got better work-life balance now. It took a few years, but I'm definitely in a good, like, you know, having great staff and, relinquishing some control well let's talk i mean that's let's talk about that in a moment because mm. that's a whole chapter unto itself and which you would have learned firsthand but in terms of making that transition out of there what was it that allowed you when you were doing law and you were surrounded by people who were afraid to look beyond the walls of the castle mm. what was it that allowed you to to make the move or even to start to question it to then make the move um, I always, I, I'm, I've always been uh, into hosti the hospitality world. Like I worked bar. Like I would tend to do about two years of working in the law firm, whatever. I'd save a lot of my money, and then I would take myself overseas with a, if a friend or a partner, and I'd travel for a couple of months. And then I'd while I was overseas, I would just like be so inspired by the different restaurants and cafes and bars, and I'd be like, this is what I want to do. I just loved it so much, and. I would make a promise to myself that when I got back to Australia that I would go into um, hospitality and work in a bar or, you know, take save my money and open my own space. But then I'd get back here and I would work hospitality for a month or two and then I realised that I wasn't saving any money. I was living way outside my means and that I was never going to be able to open the space that I wanted to unless I went back and did law and started saving my money again. So uh, it was a bit of a vicious spiral. I did that a few times where that same process happened and um, I guess I got to the point where I was just I decided to move back to Brisbane to be next to more I've got three brothers up there and they're all having babies and so I thought it might be a good time uh, at the end of my law degree before I started I was a, a first year lawyer at Westpac and I thought I'd take a bit of time and go up and when I was up in Brisbane and having that I don't know that support for my family and just um, being able to stop get off the wheel for a second, I guess, and take a step back. And I um, kind of went, no, I, I really, I really need to do this. I don't want to go back into a law firm. Um, in saying that, that still took me another five years to open Scouts. So um, I was at home for a little bit and then I met, I guess, the biggest catalyst for me actually getting off my ass and doing it was um, a girlfriend that I met who was quite a bit older than me, 10 years older than me. and. She had her own businesses, a few hairdressing salons and stuff, and she was an amazing business owner. And that whole mentor thing I was telling you about kind of played out a little bit where it was a very much a loving relationship, but also definitely there was a, a mentor aspect to it. And yeah, she really encouraged me just to, um, to do it. And she like really pushed and didn't really let up. And so I did go, we moved to sit back to Sydney together and I did go back into working legal for a while, but with the focus of 
I'm still doing this job with not to run off overseas, not just to, to save some money to open this business. So. And isn't it much easier once you do have that passion aligned focus in mind that you can really just knuckle down and do what needs to be done to get it? Yeah. I mean, there are so many times where you go, well, actually, what I'm doing today is really hard. I am exhausted and I, you know, I've barely got anything left in my tank. However, I know what I'm working for and I'm really connected to that. And it's easy just to kind of put up with it for the time being. Absolutely. I hate the term goal setting. And I think it's like, I guess I had to do that a lot when I was playing basketball. And I, like, I mean, that just feels so, I don't know, uh, cliche. But having a, like setting a financial goal for yourself or setting a target and then having that to work towards rather than just like, I kind of know what I want. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I'm, that's in the back of my mind. But actually having clear targets mm. really helps you to, to focus. And to, also, if you're, if you're not doing something you necessarily love or enjoy, you know that there's a light. Like, okay, I, didn't, I wasn't loving my job that I was doing it. I was working at UNSW in, a, in the law, legal department, but I knew that it was short term and I'm, I knew what my end game was. So. It was kind of enabled me to get up and go to work each day and be really positive because I knew it wasn't forever. It was. Well, also some people do have aversions to things that they do feel are really cliche. Like you know, I'm I'm a real one for for vision boarding and for like putting my goals, not just articulating them. Yeah, but that's adorable, Dan. I know, but like putting, like I'm I'm all over that. But also at the same time, I've heard so many people make fun of that because it's just such a it's so seemingly trite for someone that doesn't get triggered by those same motivational tools. But you have described what I call modeling, what you've called a mentorship. Um, you know, I, I model myself after heroes that are the totems of certain chapters of my life, whether they be interpersonal relationships or even, you know, Madonna, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is that I need to define a certain chapter, I'll always have heroes that I'm modeling myself after. If they can actually be in a mentorship, menteeship capacity where they're actively invested in your development, amazing, but sometimes they don't even need to know that they're your heroes in order to be really influential for your journey. Yeah. And you may not choose to articulate it as to say, my goal is X, but if you're saying, well, I'm going to be just like so-and-so in the way that they do this thing, that's goal setting. Like mm -hmm. That's articulating a vision, having a, a some sort of representation of it in a practical sense, and then using that as the model by which you measure your own uh, you kind of compartmentalize the steps to get to that. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm also interested in the idea that if you came from a, uh, a background in basketball, mm -hmm. what does that, did that give you, did that equip you with a, a process of working that then gave you even like a, a structure to approach study, to approach goal setting, to approach work? I guess um, what really gave me that structure to approach was my parents like like they were just I don't know installed a sense of like nothing like high achievement I guess in my in in my family and my brothers and I and we like kind of we have this even now this level of self pressure like I don't think even when I feel any kind of anxiety about my day or any like anxiety about my business or whatever it's not anyone else's pressure on it's just my own and that's been something that my mom just to always be like the best or the, like the best you can be or nothing like it's in basketball you know that's one you know facet of that I played I guess I played I played for Australia I played in the junior under 23s and the other 20s team I was at the AIS for a couple of years and it's so weird like because now I people ask me about sport and I'm like oh I hate sport I don't watch sport at all. I don't really participate. I played AFL and I appreciate it. And I, but I guess my life, I've very compartmentalized chapters in my life. So I had my basketball days and then I had my league, my law days. And now everything's about my businesses and, you know, hospitality and Redfern, the suburb we live and how much we love our community. And, and so, yeah, I mean, there's things that follow through from all those different chapters. But um, I guess, I guess being a business owner and opening Scouts was the biggest learning curve of any I've ever had. Like having to go from, I don't know, being uh, in a team where I was like, I guess I, I, I was always a quite a young, like one of the younger ones in the team. I was always like a junior coming through and then in the law firms I was the junior and then all of a sudden having to be a boss and finding out that you're mentoring 
other people and having to, you know, it was it was a very steep, that first year was a really steep learning curve for me, but um, also something that I changed, like I changed so much and my, conf like I've always been a confident person, but now I feel like something happened when you turn 30 and now there's a confidence and then there, now there's like a substance behind that confidence, so to speak. So I can back it up. <laughs> Whereas last time I think it was a lot of bravado before. Take it till you make it school. Of yeah, school exactly. So yeah, um, I don't know. I can't, I, I, I don't think I'll ever not be able to now do this. Like this is it for me. I, I can't imagine doing anything else other than running, like working for myself, going back to working for someone else would be very difficult, I think. And also I think if you're successful at it, why would you, you know, you, there's, there, even if you didn't always do hospitality space, you know, you, your career reinvention may continue, but you might always just choose to be different forms of Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd love to find out about that early stage of, of making, you know, you said it, it took five years between sort of really committing to the idea in your mind and then finally opening Scouts. What was that process like? What was the catalyst to, to taking the leap on that location? I mean, it, it's a cute, odd space, Scouts on it. it. Was it a butcher once upon a time? It was a fruit shop. It was a really derelict little fruit shop called Cosmos Fruit in, and Veg. In a, in a nook of George Street Redfern that was so far from it developed. wasn't activated at the time <laughs> definitely not i think scouts definitely well there's tommy's which is a great barber and he definitely like i have to give credit okay, he's he's been there for so like maybe 12 years or something and he's fantastic and they're so cool and they were there but it, yeah it's a very strange little nook it was you know um a, a little bit of a punt i guess but at the same time i lived in redfern and i had been there for a few years and i I guess when I open a business, I go, what do I want? What do I, as someone who lives here and know what, what am I missing? When I go out for lunch or whatever, what do I want to eat personally? And then I just open, I open what I want, which is hilarious because then you end up never wanting to eat at your own place. So it's definitely for the, it's definitely for everyone else. It wasn't, it wasn't for me in the end, but, um, it, I mean the five years, um, so I moved back here with my ex-girlfriend now, Jody, and, um, we, I, I said I got a job back in law again and I was the focus to save the money and we were constantly looking at spaces so we started then even though I wasn't ready just to get our head we just to like stay interested and I was constantly looking at spaces and back then I wasn't living in Redfern and I hadn't ever I hadn't lived there before and I was looking everywhere so we we're looking at Surrey and all around the place so just any kind of and I was looking to open a bar. It wasn't meant to be a cafe. So I never intended ever to open a cafe. It was always meant to be a small bar. And um, I don't know, so a few th life things happen. I had, the, had a breakup, which kind of like slowed the process down a little bit. And then I finally went, I sold my house in, in Brisbane that I owned with my little brother, which gave me a little bit of capital. And I found my, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Like I have this money, I am ready to do it. And I found this, space in Chippendale actually, um, just down the road from Frida's and um, I negotiated on the space, the legal stuff came in handy, it always does come in handy, but I negotiated on the space for a long time and really like nutted it all out and I had my builders in and we had quotes and we were ready to go and the owner was meant to do some works on his at his end and a week before we were meant to start our build. I went in, I went to the space and like nothing was done. And then the owner was like, I can't, it was, it, the whole thing just fell apart essentially. And I'd quit my job in the, like in the, doing law, what I was doing at the time, I'd quit. I had this money, I just like, I had this full flip out because sometimes these leases can take a little while to negotiate. So I was like, it's gonna be another, it could be months before I find another space that I like. Like, what am I gonna do? And then my partner at the time, was just like, just open, just open something little. Like, you don't have to open the bar right now. You, you know, maybe it's better for you as your first hospitality business not to go into a nighttime venue. Uh, nighttime venues tend to be less forgiving. People expect a certain thing. So if you're learning and you're on your, in your first business and you don't nail it, people tend to like 
not come back. But if a cafe, people are more forgiving. Like it's a little bit laid back. It's if you're not, if you don't get things right the first time or things get, you know, then people tend to like be like, it's okay. Like we'll we'll still come back tomorrow. Like as long as the coffee's okay. Exactly. So I don't know. I went okay. Maybe that's what I'll do. Is I'll just open a little tiny sandwich shop, and we'll just make some cute sandwiches and some coffee and. It'll be really chill, and I'll sell. I'll open it for a year, and then I'll sell it, and I'll be ready. I'll, by then, I would have found the bar space, and I'll be ready for the bar. And it didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> like we opened Scouts, and literally on our first day, which was a soft opening, we didn't tell anyone that we we're opening. Uh, we I had to I had to close Scouts at midday because I'd sold out of all of our food and couldn't didn't just didn't have time to prep enough for lunch and stuff. So then I stayed up all night that that Monday night. Like pretty much the whole night. I don't think I don't think I went to sleep and just prepped all night so that I could open the door on Tuesday and have enough food to sell. And we were just however busy we were on Monday, we were twice as busy on Tuesday and then twice as busy on Wednesday. And I just could not get coops. My partner was took a whole week off work. I had called in all of my friends that and they all took sick days one one after the other at a time from their jobs to come in and help me and work at the front register so I could just like make food and. It was just many. From day one, we opened Scouts. We realised that we were people were desperate for something like that in Redfern. So it was great. But what do you think the the Scouts on a special source was that allowed it? Because I mean, places open all the time and don't do as well as that. Um, if you are, the thing about Scouts is you know the space. It's quite a grungy little space. We did a really cute fit out, quite clean. The place looked really Redfern. I think it really fitted a vibe of the old and the new. Um, it was a, literally, it's a roller door garage hole in the wall. Um, we played great R&B music in the, its small space. We played, we had a, it was a bit of everything. The food obviously was important, really important. We did, we did, I mean, I think our signature was sandwiches and we did these incredible $10 sandwiches. And that's the thing as well. If the idea of being able to allow someone to mentally go, I can go there and buy lunch for $10 mm-hmm. is such a win because where does, where can you do that these days? Yeah. And I mean, I know your I know your food style. You have a my, the, the thing that I like most about the way in which you design a meal is it's classics with a twist. Yeah. It's things that are, that you've heard of before that you know that you're probably fond of, like you've never had it. And I think the simplicity of the offering when you subvert expectation by doing something that is better than or smarter than or the best version of a simple fave. That's it. Well, I kind of like I kind of. Even now they have a small bar and the food is the kind of food I've always wanted to cook, but I get a bit, I'm a bit avert to really overly chefy food. Like I just kind of think if you're not making the, ver- whatever you're cooking, if you're not making it a bit better than what it was as a classic, then don't change the classic. So whatever, if you're going to change something, you better make it like the, a better version of it. And we don't try and do, we're not, we're not super fancy. We're just taking delicious, good produce, great flavour, pro- like flavours that work together and putting it a little spin on it, a little scout spin or a little bart spin or whatever. Yeah, another thing I realised as well as you, the, the ingredients are the star of the dish, not the design, not the presentation necessarily, although everything does look beautiful, but I always come away from something you've prepared and think, oh, I never thought of corn that way or I never thought of, you know, like, uh, like a potato that way. I, I, I had what was, in a sense, a simple baked potato at the bar not too long ago. Oh, the sweet potato? With the, yeah, with the chives. And, the, and, I was, mm-hmm. and I was like, I have to learn to cook this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I cook sweet potatoes every second day and I've never had a better sweet all baked you potato is, in my life. you just put it in the oven ho- whole. <laughs> That's all you have to do. It's like the, probably the easiest it's, thing I've ever but, made. But, you know, my favourite cooking, you know, I come from an Indian background. Mm-hmm. Dal is my staple. I said, dal has three ingredients. No one, no two dals are ever alike. Mm-hmm. And yet the, there are three ingredients. No to, you know, like the, it's the minutia of the attention to detail in the preparation, no matter how spare the ingredients are. Yep. And those little micro choices along the way is the thing that defines the whole experience. Absolutely. And, you know, Scouts was like, it, I guess we just got the ingredients right for that business. It was, and, you know, we're part of the community. Redfern is an unusual place in Sydney because... And, and it's in transition, so how do you even know what version of Redfern you're speaking to? Yeah, exactly. But, and, you know, we opened Scouts four, four years ago. And like I, I guess you know, we had a really good. We we knew people within the community, so when we opened, we already had like a an interested customer base. We weren't like the fresh new kids on the block who had come in from somewhere and were trying to open a business. We we knew people, the people who lived and worked in Redfern, 
and yeah so it wasn't and I guess the way the business was set up as well like it was a pretty clever like you know you order at the front counter and you wait out the front so we had like by like week three we had like a lineup at lunchtime that was stretched down the block and it's that you know when people breed people breed people so people would see that and be like what the hell is happening there are people really lining up for a sandwich but you know and we got better and we got more efficient and I got a lot more staff we went from just myself and my barista to having seven staff on in that tiny space every day so that's how I got got my staff management practice (laughs) but um yeah it was a it was a beast of a business it was hard and it wasn't necessarily the my the business I was pa- gonna my most passionate business, but I guess I'm passionate about the fact that it was like I feel very like I lo- have a lot of love for Scouts, and it, it definitely gave me the tools to open up Bart Junior, which is my small bar, and not make I guess the silly mistakes that I had the flexibility to make with the cafe. Work isn't always fun. You don't necessarily always, even if you are doing something you love, I don't think it's necessarily always a great time. And in general, the more extreme version of that is, is I mean, for me, I always wanted to be a feature film director. That was what I fantasized about throughout my film school education. And then I started spending a lot of time on sets when I wasn't the director once I got out of film school and I was like this sucks mm. <laughs> I don't want to be on set like with a bunch of disgruntled embittered tradies long like, days lo- too. Lo- long days yeah. no life I'm like okay the average Australian film director makes one or two movies do I want to dedicate my entire life to a career of this with the promise of maybe directing one or two movies. And even if you did solve the riddle and get a feature film made in Australia, would anyone go and see it? If, I, if I'm spending all this energy, like dedicating my life to this career where no one's even gonna see the thing that I make, I'm gonna find another platform or medium mm. to work in. So the reason why I go on that round is because, you know, it's the lifestyle that you, in terms of working out where your passions lie and how to connect the dots between what you love to do and what you do do, or, or how you earn a living, Designing the lifestyle, I think, is as important as working out the career choice. And so, you know, for you, it's n- owning a, a hospitality business is, is very consuming of the lifestyle, but yet you still love it. What is it about the, the day-to-day that you, that you struggle with? What is, what is the biggest joy in your, in your job? Um, I guess for me, I guess underpinning my passion for what I do, like whether it's scouts or bar, is definitely my love of food, not just eating food. I've always loved that. Like I used to make up songs as a kid about eating food, um, but it's, I love cooking. I've always loved to cook and I've always loved to cook for people. I very rarely cook for myself. Um, if I am home alone, I very rarely will, I'll take myself out somewhere and treat myself somewhere nice for dinner. But um, if I'm cooking, I'm cooking for people like, many people as you've seen like my my dinner my backyard parties go from being for 10 people to 30 pretty quickly um i've i love it i love i've come from a big family um i love the, hos- the whole idea of, of hospitality is in caring for other people providing for other people i love people i love hanging out with my friends i love having I don't know, friends around me i love giving great service and making someone happy um, that's the things that I love about my day at Bart now. I, when I, you have a great day, it's when you know, you're making beautiful food, things are going right, the food's coming out right, people are having a great time in your space. And you know, going, you know, it's easy because I, I guess with Bart, I opened it in Redfern. All my friends live in Redfern. Um, I get to see all my people all the time and I don't, I'm at work, but I get to see all my buddies. They come like any night I get to see at least like couple of people that I'm that I'm close to but that's easy that like those the, my friends are easy to please because they they have a good time no matter what it's the people that you come into your space that you haven't seen before and they don't know you and making them feel special and making them leave your venue or you know have a dinner that's more than just a dinner that more than just like blanket service where would you like you know da 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 and they get but having them leave a space and they can, having them think that they, you, you kind of have a philosophy, make everyone feel like they're your friend. 
and it's not being fake it's actually making people feel like we have a great bar staff team we have a lot of fun we all get along the whole idea is to extend that out so that when people come into this venue that, that you might not know that they feel like they're part of your fun and part of your space and part of the family so when people leave and they come up to you and they're like we've had such a great time the food was great and the service is great like that and that's when you go i love my job like i've made some they're really happy they feel really special people love to know that you know that the owners there and they've come over and spent a little bit of time because you're actually right you're in the re- you're in the room yeah like the, it's great it's very the operational is, yeah the kitchen yep. is not separate from the dining experience yeah all my three businesses we've fitted out um and because i spend i love to be in the kitchen i'm not always in the kitchen i have some great little junior kitchen uh, chefs happening. So, um, but I always said that if I'm gonna work in a kitchen, in a, in a hospital space, that it needs to be part of the room. So all our kitchens are in its open plan. I can see everyone who walks into the bar. I can be flat out with a hundred dockets on the rail, but still be able to like chuck a hand up and wave to someone as they walk in or out, which is really nice. So I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't really believe in back room kitchens where the chefs are all tucked away and never get to see the reward. I guess the best thing about it is when you send food out and you get to see that people are enjoying it. Otherwise, you know, it would be quite disheartening, I think, to be cooking this beautiful food and never get to, never really get to see uh, people eating your food. Well, chefs are artists. That's, I always, my memory of my brief flirtation with hospitality of which I've been fired from every single job was that, <laughs> um, don't ever hire me, was that um, the chefs always just seem so down on the, about the fact that I didn't, and I was wondering why, like why are chefs always so exhausted and disgruntled and, and I was always like ferrying messages back like table four said that was the best mashed potato they've ever eaten in their entire life because they just need to be reminded that, that there's a human connection to mm-hmm. the work that they're and, doing. But not everyone, they don't get that all the time and also chefing is hard, like we're pretty lucky, like I guess because I work in the kitchen I'm really, I'm, I, I'm really good with the hours and my staff and looking after them and you know, I want longevity from them, so I don't want to burn them out. And I want them to, you know, be happy and the way to keep a team for, you know, we try and keep our staff, if, you know, we, our staff, we keep them for a long time. We want... Across multiple businesses Yeah, sometimes. we want them to stay, stick around. We want them to love their job. So we look, we, you know, to do that though, you have to almost take on a parenting role. And so some businesses, you know, there's all different ways to manage staff. And the way we kind of go, our philosophy is sort of like, make them your family. And that, in its own way, has its payoffs, and it also has its detriments because you know you do get that call from your staff because you are family and saying, "I've I've been kicked out of my house. Can I come and stay with you for a couple of weeks?" And as a boss, some bosses would be like, "That would not be appropriate." But the way we are, we'd be like, "Of course you can. Like you are that our staff are our family. Um, you have to deal with. I call them my kids. I call my staff my babies. It is like having teenage babies." Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of amazing rewards that go off that and you get to be, you know, part of their life, but there's also like, you have to keep that line of, you know, boss stuff because there is times where you do have to, you know, you have to have that respect and stuff. So it can be a little tricky, but you get, you do get good, you get better at it. And so what are the, when you have a challenge uh, in your day, you know, when you don't necessarily love your job on those days, Although I feel like when you're connected to something that you truly give a, give a uh, you know, that gives you great satisfaction, those feelings are fleeting. But when it is hard, where do those challenges come from? Um, well, it's funny that you that kept rolled on from the staff chat because usually what happens, usually the days where things are not okay or when you're, is usually related to staff. It's usually related to people. And I think that's probably not just hospitality, that's probably across all industry. Um, you can only do your job to the best of your ability if everyone else who works with you is doing theirs underneath you or beside you, wherever, to the, and everyone's firing. So when staffing is, you know, off or someone's caught in sick or someone's off their game, it really does affect everyone else in your team. Those days are always really hard, days where your things, you know, working for yourself is so great. But I definitely don't think it's for everyone. I don't think, I definitely wouldn't be telling everyone to go out there and work for yourself. It's, it's, it's sort of like, it's quite high stress and you kind of, you sort of learn how to, as you get, like, get into it, how to 
operate at a level of stress and not feel it as much anymore. And you kind of realise when you stop for a second or go on a holiday or take some time out and you're like, whoa, I've been running. I've been running here all the time. And that's something that you just, if you, you can, if you can manage that and learn how to take time for yourself and that, you kind of like learn how to just, it never really goes away because at the end of the day, your every day, your business is, that's your livelihood, that's your income. It needs to be perfect every day. Um, but you do learn to deal with it better. But I guess, yeah, the days where things really, I kind of like go, what am I doing? I hate, I hate today is usually related to some things that are usually out of your control. Like someone else has let you down or, you know, other deliveries haven't come in and you, you've got to run it, like run around doing someone else's job. Someone's, usually it's because someone else hasn't like stepped up and done their, their job properly and then you have to take on their stuff as well as your own. Um, but do you think there's a version of um, success that allows you to be completely observing of the stress without embodying it? Yeah, I think so. I think some people really, I think, like I said, I don't think anyone can own a small business or a business and not just not have stress in their life like that. I just don't think that that's a thing, but I think some people are really good at managing that and really good at like taking I meant like looking after their mental health and um, I think that's something that I've definitely gotten much better at like and that sometimes is just making making time for yourself but but valuable time like um, I've learned to when I do have the hours off in a morning or whatever do not pick up your phone don't open your screen take yourself for that run go you know go to the go to the ocean go for that swim go catch up with friends go for that coffee the worst thing you can do, I think, is if when you have that time is, is pick up a social media or something and, and before you know it, you've lost that, those two hours and no one feels rested. No one feels like has a, like a good check out when they've been, you know, scrolling through socials. So that's... I'm floating a theory at the moment, which is that, you know, being, you know, I, I think that what you do is very creative, but you might not even call yourself a creative, but I think that being someone who is a creative entrepreneur or someone who's actively pursuing their passions either as a business owner or as someone who's just going for it as a freelancer for example it's so easy to coast when you're kind of um, supported by an institution if you're part of a, a company but I think when you are taking responsibility for yourself it really makes me feel like you're an athlete you know you have to train your athleticism mentally physically spiritually emotionally you have to support your athleticism with nutrition and rest and calm and there's this i think people for the last for the last century have been used to putting the responsibility of their well-being in the hands of the institution that they're part of but as the world continues to move towards the gig economy mm -hmm. and people are in a sense contractors within businesses selling skills until that skill is no longer needed and then they have to reinvent their career again and again there's no one's going to take responsibility for their well-being if they don't do it themselves so I wonder if you having come from a professional sports background that understands that your machine is your livelihood has an inbuilt awareness around the needs of that machine in a way that has equipped you in business the way that the average lawyer come business owner doesn't necessarily have? Mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, I mean, phys everyone knows the benefits of physical activity and isn't, we're not, you know, talking about They, they do, new. but everyone also knows, you know, everyone knows everything to do with what, uh, healthy body, mm. healthy mind, you know, we should meditate, we should not eat refined sugars, we should get eight hours of sleep a night. We all technically know these things. But how many of us actually apply them? Yeah, it's true. And you know what? I have, I've definitely, you know, been guilty at certain t times in my life of not giving myself that that care, like self care, and that like a lot. And a lot of time, you kind of like pretend to. And I found that with when I opened Scouts, was I the last thing? The last thing I prioritized was myself. Everything else came first, and then after that came like me and that was a like I said that was a really tough two years and it was a really big learning curve and I was not unhappy because I didn't give myself time to even think about whether I was happy or not I was just like on this on this like wheel but I think 
I was unfit, I got fat, I put on a heap of weight, I was just literally waking up in the morning, going to Scouts, working all day, going to the pub, having two beers, coming back to Scouts, prepping all night, getting up in the morning, doing the same thing all over again. Like, I was on this, like, wheel and like I know enough enough to know that I, that like that I would that'll never happen again. Like um and you know and the reason why when I opened Bart I decided to do it with a business partner rather than just on my own or with a, a girlfriend was because I wanted to share that I needed to have somewhat more better like better balance and I needed to do that and I also wanted to know that my baby, the, the bar, was always taken care of by someone who was invested. So you know, that's why I opened the Bart Junior for Amanda and it's it's great. Like it's great to share that load and you know What's Amanda's main focus if yours is food? So um man's has come from a corporate background as well. I I when I was opening Bart, I um I sat down, I was like, I know I wanna do this, I wanna do it with a, f- a person that I'm friends with or that I respect or whatever, but I ha- didn't know who and I, I knew I loved Amanda, I knew she was great with people. So the first thing I was like, she is fantastic with people. And even though she has no hospitality background, zero, she works in PR and copyright. Um, I remember taking her out for lunch and just telling her what I wanted to do and that I wanted her to do it because I knew she also hated her job. And that she was my age and, you know, we're both 30 and we were like looking for, I guess, I knew she was like, what am I gonna do for the rest of my life? And I was like, you should come and do this with me. And she just laughed in my face and was like, you're hilarious. I'm never, I have no experience with this. I'm like, you don't have to, I've got experience. I've got people in my life with experience. You just have to come and learn and be your smiley, amazing self. So she came on finally after, you know, it took a, her actual, her boyfriend actually was in the end was like the one who said, like why what are you doing take this opportunity go go like go with it so and now she's um she works more the front bar um we've kind of like divided our teams we have floor bar kitchen and she works more floor and does like front of house so she wants to like seats people and takes care of that kind of side of things and uh does all the behind the scenes stuff that i hate like administration wages the you know tax, all the bass, all the accounting. That's Amanda does all that, which is heaven because I am hopeless at that stuff. And also play to your strengths. You yeah. know, there's no point you taking three times as long to do something inefficiently when you can outsource that to a partner. Or yeah, and she doesn't mind. She actually really likes it. She's a spreadsheet girl. That's Love great. Them. I am hopeless. It's I, I I you know funnily enough, you know. From a law background, I used to spend 99% of my time on a computer and I was very technology efficient, but after being off away from it for five years, I think I've convinced myself now that I cannot do it. And you know when you start to say, I can't, I can't, and all of a sudden now I, I don't know if it's now because I say that so I don't have to, so no one makes me do it, but I've convinced myself that I'm very computer illiterate and so I very rarely have to have to even print menus or anything. I'm like, I don't know how to print a menu. I'm sorry, you'll have to come in early and do it for me. But um, yeah, she takes care of all that stuff for me, which is really, really great. At least I can just literally focus on, on the food. And I do, I've been working um, on doing, I've been doing the cocktail list as well, which um, even though I don't have a lot of drinks back around, I guess um, co- the cocktails are, uh, like extension little, of food. Little they're, they're, meals in a glass. It's balancing, it's flavour, it's like it's a very similar thing to designing a you menu. Know, you know, you like to drink, you know, you know I what I love to drink. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I, I want to know when you were in the stage of before Scouts, before, while you were still in law, what were the signs from the universe that hospitality was the way forward? Or actually, no, prior to that, what were the signs from the universe that you had to get out? Did, were you turning to like rampant modes of escapism? Were you unhappy, were you deeply dissatisfied? Um, so while I studied law, I got a really amazing job as a paralegal at Westpac in the city. And um, it was, it was, it was amazing. Like I was there pre-GFC, which was- The heyday. <laughs> yeah, and that in a bank, in the big bank, Westpac. Like it was, and it was incredible. Like I, I was just, I was the only paralegal, I was the first paralegal that they ever employed at Westpac as well. So. Um, I worked specifically with one team of about 10 lawyers, but there were a baby, uh, maybe 80 lawyers in the, in the whole of the Westpac legal team. But 
I loved it. Like I was just like, this is amazing. My team, my little team specifically, were incredible lawyers and awesome people. And they were just, I, I just lucked in, I guess. I really lucked into this role. And the, I had a lot of fun. And like I said, I got given as a paralegal a corporate card. And they're like, don't walk anywhere in the city. Just take a cab. And I literally be going two blocks. And they're like, no, we're not walking. We're going to, you know, use your corporate card. And we'd go out for lunches. And our, the parties were incredible. And it was just, I was just on this like, oh, man, this is, yeah, this is, this is good. This is my life. And then the GFC happened. And oh my gosh, it was like the change overnight. It was um, it was incredible to be working there during that time, just to see how different things got, like the the people getting walked out, so many people fired, uh, all the corporate cards taken off everyone, no more parties, no more corporate accounts. Like it was broken. All of our desks all of a sudden now open open for like our floor plan went from having 60 people in the space to 120. They just packed. They kept packing more people in to save money on on building costs and things like that. But I guess things changed and then all of a sudden with discontent and during that time, my team changed a lot. And I realized that I was lucky because I was, I just happened to be working with an incredible group of young lawyers who were that mentor that did inspire me and I had a lot of fun with and they were, they were really good at their jobs. And I guess as the team changed a little bit, I realized that that was a, not the, necessarily the norm, that I was just really lucky in that first job because I worked with a lot of other people and some really dry, very hard to work, like work with or get you know much out of and I just started to struggle, like I guess, like I said, I'm very people orientated and I was just a bit like, okay, this job has run its course for me, I'm going to go work in a firm, in a law firm and try, you know, and I just, I just hated it, <laughs> I just... The game of like the, the the corporate game, the climbing the corporate ladder, going to these small talk events. The first question you get asked every single time at any of these lawyer events, like these drinks after work, is, "Oh, so what school in Sydney did you go to?" And that used to just like kill me because one, I didn't go to school in Sydney, which is in some ways a blessing because when I told them I went to a school in Brisbane, some little house, they'd just go blank face, "Oh yeah, yeah, cool," but they couldn't put you into a box and that's what they essentially people want to do in that that sphere it's very much a, a boys club as well I was lucky in a way because you know tomboy here played basketball for professionally people the boys were interested in me they wanted to know about my sport they, wanted, something to talk to you they wanted to talk to me about you know, the AIS and playing for Australia and stuff so I had an in, in, in with the, gu the guys anyway but um just like that whole you know oh the, what school where did you grow up in Sydney oh, you grew up in, you know, Elizabeth Bay or you grew up over in Wallara or whatever. It was like... Um, the categorisation. They could put yeah. you in a box and it was just, I don't know, it was very smarmy and I just started to realise that the law, that maybe that wasn't for me. I had to, I tried a few things. I went and worked for a community law firm. So I was like, okay, maybe corporate isn't for me. I'll go work for prisons, legal service. And it was definitely incredible work, but again, just... The people, I think, after working the hours they were working and the, for the pay, it's a totally different pay bracket. They were quite jaded and there wasn't a lot of positivity. I was just really struggling to find people that loved their job to work with. And at the same time, I went to, I was down in Melbourne a bit. My partner um, lived there and I just, the small bar scene was so incredible in Melbourne. And all going out to all these bars, I'm like, this is what Sydney needs. This is what, this is what I'm missing in, in Sydney. And literally at that time, Sydney passed the small bar license. And I don't know, I just was like, I'm gonna do this. How much money do you really think you need? 50,000? I'm gonna do this. You need a lot more than 50,000. Um, but. It's good to not know that at the time. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot more. But you know, that's when the seed was planted around that time. And I think that the discontent had started and I started doubting. And once you get that little bit of like, self that doubt about where you're going and then I kind of just I kind of just grabbed onto this small bar scene I talked about I talked about it all the time to people like if you ask any of my best friends they will tell you that I've been talking about opening a small bar for over 10 years like for a long time I've been talking about it um and I guess it just took it just took me that long to you know I didn't have and this is not a hero story at all and this is not like a yay like I didn't have um financial support from my my parents I didn't had I didn't have that any financial backing I knew that if I did this I had to do it on my own so that's probably you know a big reason why it took so long because I really did have to you know save save that money 
be really sure there was no safety net for me. And, and you know, it's one thing to save all this money and then go, now I'm going to drop it all in this one big dream and hope it works out for the best. But I don't know, I didn't really doubt myself. I kind of knew, I, I felt it, I never really thought that it, whatever we open wouldn't be a success because I guess I knew that what I was opening was something that I wanted for someone who lived in that area and I was like, people will want this. I always am intrigued by the idea of the, the thing that keeps you up at night or the thing that wakes you up at two in the morning, you know, like, and sometimes for me it's a, a creative concept that I've just got to write down or it's a stress to do with, you know, oh my God, have I got this thing ready for this shoot? You know, if something wakes you up at two in the morning, It's what usually is it? something like, fuck, did I leave the oven on at work? Or, damn, I forgot to like order that thing. Like, it's very rarely I wake up going, oh my God, I, I'm so excited to, you know, cook with that amazing product today. Oh my God, the buffalo mozzarella is coming in today. Um, it's usually like, shit, I've forgotten to do something or have I done something? And you know, it, there was, been, there's been a few times when, uh, mostly scouts where I've woken up and gone, did I turn that thing off and got up and gone downstairs and checked just to make sure that I have. Has, have you ever found it on? Uh, no, thank God. Although we did almost burn scouts down one night um, when two of my little staff left the, the, they left the oven on and um, on a high, high heat and we had lilies there, but luckily we were across the road from the fire station and the boys are very lovely. They come in all the time. They, 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 they sorted it out pretty quickly and without too much consequence. So one time, and that was, a, that was the only time you, you need to, you learn, you learn your lesson. I w I'd love to end by asking people, you know, if I were to check in with you in a year's time, is there some key goal or something that's currently just a work in progress that you would love to have in the bag? Yeah, I guess I'm always, I'm a bit of a sucker. Since I opened Scouts, I'm always already thinking about the next thing and you know like we open scouts and a year later we so a year and a half two years we open morris and then a year later we open bart and to be honest like we're coming up to a year now for bart we're at june in june 28th our first birthday um but it's a bit of a different beast because it's i guess it's a lot, lot bigger a lot like more going on with the bar that i definitely want to dedicate i definitely want to dedicate at the very least the next six months solely try and not get outside get to focus on what might the next possible thing might be just focus on this beautiful little dream that I've got in my hands right now and uh, but you know there's there's things I'm talking to there's a possibility of opening a chain of little small boutique bottle shops natural wine focused with a little kind of food you know food space attached to it very small but that's sort of like a, a bit of a, a dream or a work in progress, but the, you know, licensing in Sydney is, a, is, as you probably know, is pretty tough at the moment. So, but yeah, right now, I think I just have to stop, like really just focus on, on Bart. It's got a lot of potential. And stop making babies and just raise Stop making babies. babies and look after the ones that you've got, exactly. And it's a pretty sweet baby, so. It's a beautiful baby. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you if you were to give George of five years ago some advice about what, it, what uh, some nugget of advice that would equip you for the Scouts journey, mm. having done three now, what would you tell yourself? I would have said to myself pre-opening Scouts to staff for success. So staff it thinking that you're going to be crazy to, like so that when I opened I would have been like prepared for the for the success that it was and not trying to do everything on my own and I probably would have said just learn how to relinquish control a little bit earlier so it just took me a long time to let go of all every detail of that business and and I think once I learned how to like delegate and relinquish a little bit of the control I became a lot a lot happier more balanced person but yeah those are the those are the two things very specifically for me, but I am a control freak, so that's always going to be tough. Relinquish control, but but find the staff that allow you to guiltlessly... Absolutely, find the staff. Like, and I've been really lucky. I've always had great staff. I'm, 
Uh, and they're every start the, in hospitality. Your team is everything. That they are the people that will enable you to take your day off. They're the people that you trust with your your business, and they the, they end up being you know the soul of your business as well. So, you know, they're very very important people. Well, they certainly are. I really enjoy the experience of coming in as a punter in terms of who I get to interact with in this space. Yeah, we've we've got so we've got some interesting characters. Yeah, but also good people attract good people. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, definitely. And that's the other thing. Like, you tend to find that if you hire someone great, they kind of do the next sort of hiring for you because you know, like Jamie at Scouts or whatever. I didn't have to really work that hard to get great staff because they come in. She's so great. They'd be like, we want to work with you. And they would just hire themselves essentially. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, you're right. Good people attract good people. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.